Pastor Teddy here from Calvary Gospel Church in Hornpain, and Easter's coming soon, actually very quickly. So uh, today we're going to start doing a little series just on maybe why Easter still matters, or a little bit just about Easter. Um, the reality is that I didn't start going to church as an adult until I was like 37. So I really, until that time, had no idea really about what Easter was all about and what it meant. And I, and I imagine there's probably a lot of people nowadays that have no idea really um, what Easter's all about. So let's pray and let's get started. Father God, I pray for all those who are suffering and they're struggling with the effects of this COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, Father God, I ask you to bring them rest, peace, comfort, and bring assurance to those who are suffering, possibly from depression today, uh, for those that are battling substance abuse, for those tormented with thoughts of suicide, uh, with thoughts of self-harm, with thoughts of hurting themselves, with cutting, uh, those who are in abusive relationships, uh, they're in a relationship where they just don't know if they can go on another day, another week. They're just at the end of their rope. Lift them up, Lord. Help us to hold them up in prayer. And for those who do call you, Lord, may they be strong and courageous as it tells us in Deuteronomy 31 verse 6 be strong and courageous and your word tells us that you're not going to leave us you're not going to forsake us you won't leave us uh, Hebrews 13 and 5 tells us I will never leave you I will never forsake you and we're grabbing onto that promise we will hold on to that and Lord God please show us that you're still in control and Heavenly Father I just do I ask that you be with every word that I speak today, Lord. Help it to be the words that you want us to, to say, what you want the people to hear. And Lord, I just thank you for giving us comfort and peace. And just praise your holy name, Lord. In your mighty name I pray, amen. Thank you, Jesus. So today I'm going to explain maybe just a little bit about history, some of the key people that were involved in the, the days leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus. And over the next few days, uh, we're going to talk... Uh, about primarily three specific people who interacted with Jesus and today we're going to start with Caiaphas and we'll see how Caiaphas's agenda put him at odds with God, with Jesus, with Holy Spirit and perhaps you may just see that there's a little bit of Caiaphas in us too. Uh, Caiaphas was the high priest, he was the most powerful influential person in Jerusalem during the time of Jesus' ministry next to the Romans. Caiaphas was the connection to the Roman Empire he was the person that communicated with Pontius Pilate and the other leaders. And Caius's family, well, they had controlled the temple for about 40 years. And that control meant money, and lots of it. They were an extremely wealthy family. Life was pretty good for Caiaphas. Well, good until a carpenter turned rabbi took to the streets. Jesus, rabbi, threatened that money, threatened that security. Because everywhere that Jesus went, crowds went to crowds of hundreds, crowds of thousands. Uh, Luke chapter 14 verse 25 tells us now large crowds were going along with him and in Mark 10 verse 1 it reaffirms it and says getting up he went from there to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan and crowds gathered around him again and according to his custom he taught them. Uh, later crowds gathered around him again and Jesus fed 5,000 with the loaves and the fishes and the number who ate were 5,000 men besides the women and children. Crowds were a threat to Rome. Crowds made Rome nervous. Crowds made Caiaphas nervous. Caiaphas was supposed to keep the crowds under control. He was supposed to disperse them. And Caiaphas knew when Jesus spoke, he had a different authority and extraordinary confidence. And Matthew chapter 7, verse 29 tells us, for he taught with real authority. And that was quite unlike their uh, teachers of the religious law. But the problem for Caiaphas was that the people, the ordinary common people, they heard that authority and confidence too. And Jesus didn't, well, he didn't pull any punches. In all of Matthew chapter 23, we hear Jesus take the temple rulers to task. Um, he confronted their hypocrisy. In verse 3, it says, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. It's the old, do as I say, not as I do. And that's been around for a long time, obviously. In verse 13, 
It says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees and hypocrites. And verse 33 says, You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape from being condemned to hell? Well, so now you can kind of understand why Caiaphas had a little bit of a rift going with Jesus. He had a problem with Jesus. He didn't really like Jesus' attitude or his words. And Jesus challenged the foundation of Caiaphas' wealth and fame. The straw, the straw though, that broke the camel's back, it wasn't what Jesus said. It was what he did. Jesus raised a dead man. And not just any dead man. Lazarus well-known, and buried for four days. Um, John eleven seventeen 17 says, Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave for four days already. And the significance of four days is they believed, they believed that a person's soul left his body after three days. So even a god couldn't raise a dead person after more than three days. But seeing Lazarus, the crowds grew. And John uh, chapter 12, verse 9 says, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there, and they came. And not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And Caiaphas realized their plan to discredit Jesus publicly, it wasn't working. They would ask uh, Jesus trick questions, but Jesus always knew their intent. And Jesus answered with godly wisdom and authority. An example of Luke uh, chapter 20, verse 22. It says, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right, and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. So this time, they think they have him. They think they've got the best question, the perfect question. And in verse 22, it says, Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? In verse 23 and 24, Jesus sees, he sees through it. He saw through their duplicity and said to them, Show me a denarius. Show me a denarius. Whose inscription are on it? Caesar's, they replied. And Jesus said, Then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Frustrated, Caiaphas called the meeting of the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the chief priests. This was unusual. They didn't get along. They each had their own agendas. They had their own goals, their own motives, separate agendas. And for us today, that would be like having the Liberals, the Conservatives, the NDP, and the Green Party all get together to have a meeting, and everybody agreeing. Mm, nice try, but not much chance of that happening. So, in John chapter 11, verse 47 and 48, it says, uh, They asked, What are we accomplishing? Here is this man performing many signs, and if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come. And they'll take away both our temple and our nation. They were worried about their reputation, their fame, their money. Yes, their money. But John 11, verses 49 and 50, Caiaphas spoke up. And of course, he did not make it sound like it was his fortune he was looking after. But he said, you do not realize it is better to want for you, better for you that one man die for the people than the whole people perish. John eleven fifty three tells us that so from that day on they plotted to take his life, and when you decide to follow Jesus, it's going to cost you something too. Perhaps, perhaps that is why you resisted. Perhaps that's why I resisted God for so long. Caiaphas had found his advantage, or so he thought. He heard Jesus called King of the Jews, and he told Rome that Jesus said he was king. That alone was enough to get Jesus crucified. So, when it came time for Jesus to be in front of Pontius Pilate, Caiaphas, now he may not have been the first to cry out, Crucify him! Crucify him! But regardless, it started and the mania took over. The death chant, the end for Jesus, his fate was decided, and Pontius Pilate washes his hands turns Jesus over to be crucified. Caiaphas had won. Or so he thought. Jesus was dead, the threat was gone, or at least Caiaphas thought. Until the sun rose on that third day and a guard came running and said, the body of the Jew whom you crucified, it's missing. 
Then came sightings of Jesus. Over 500 people saw Jesus alive. Within weeks, Jesus' followers were saying, you crucified him, but God raised him from the dead. We have seen him alive and well. The crowds grew larger. The crowds grew even larger. People believed in the resurrected Jesus. And now Caiaphas realized that Jesus had accomplished more in death than in life. And what Caiaphas thought would be the end was actually the catalyst to our eternal beginning. Our eternal end. Life in heaven. Forever. Now, what does that have to do with us? There is a little Caiaphas in all of us. We want to preserve things as they are. We want God to either help us or get out of our way. Get out of the way. Clear out. Easter is a warning against that way of thinking. God does not compromise. Those who reject him will spend eternity in hell. It's not pretty, but it's real. Um, what has replaced God at the center of your life? Your job, your university degree, college diploma, money, power, popularity. Maybe, maybe it's an unhealthy relationship. You know it's bad, but you can't let it go. And he said he won't hit you again. She said she'll be loyal. Maybe it's sexual sin, pornography, adultery. Maybe it's drugs. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your secret sin is. It doesn't matter. God already knows. So remember, God has a plan for you. And it's a fantastic plan just for you. Jeremiah 29, 11, a well-known verse says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. But there's a little voice that chirps on your shoulder and says, But you're worthless. You'll never measure up. You'll never make it. You're worthless. You can't quit the drugs. You need more money. You need more stuff. You have to get a higher mark than everybody else. Just watch one more porn movie. Ah, your wife's working, she'll never know. Just watch one more porn movie. Have you noticed? The things, these things, they demand more from you than you get from them. Are your secrets killing you from within? Saying yes to God will cost you something, but saying no will cost you so much more. Actually, it'll cost you way more because it'll cost you everything. It'll cost you your soul. But it doesn't have to be that way. God wants what is best for you. But does that mean everything will be perfect? <laughs> Absolutely not. God never said that. That's not a promise from him. But it does mean he will get you through it to the end. And when you stop trying to drive the bus and you let Jesus take the wheel, you'll be amazed at the peace that you will enjoy. And if you're watching today and you realize that you've been rejecting God, rejecting Jesus and Holy Spirit, I invite you to say this prayer with me now. It is. It's time for a fresh start. It's time to be born again. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner, and I ask your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sin, and I repent of my sins. I invite you into my heart and my life today. I want to trust you, and I want to follow you as my Lord and Savior. And in your precious name I pray. Amen. Now, if you just prayed this prayer with me, I ask you to contact me by phone uh, or text 705-570-1881 or on Messenger, Ted Sheneman, S-C-H-E-N-I-M-A-N, or Ted and Deb, you'll find us there. And um, in our next session, we're going to take a look at Judy's, Judas Iscariot. So uh, next time, be blessed, be a blessing.